Okay, so let me just share a screen really quickly. As soon as I get my uh, confidential business information out of my browser. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sebastian, you want to set anything up before I jump in? Uh, introduction or anything like that? Yeah, of course. So I was trying to submit Jeff through another student run program called Indoresis, which was an ad competition and received some direct career guidance and mentorship from him. So I would thought it would be super interesting for you all to be able to hear more, more or less from a general perspective of his career and how he has made a with his uh, tagline of making him living for words. And uh, hopefully he can help you all along your way, whether it's if you want to work in public relations or not. Cool. And so I saw everybody's um, kind of notes about where you're from and everything like that. Um, I'm curious if you wouldn't mind kind of as we as we talk, Tell me kind of exactly what you're studying. Um, you know, if it's advertising in general, great. But if you have some specialties there, throw that in the chat. Um, I'd love to. I'd love to see that. And then, um, you know, the the other thing I guess is uh, it's well. Sorry, certainly I'm interested if anyone is actually studying PR. Because well, that'll be kind of a slightly different uh, perspective than some. Although I'm actually trying to see where my chat is when I'm on full screen. Maybe possible I can't see it. It should be so. your top of your monitor. I got, cool. I got it. All right. So marketing business analytics. Awesome. Very cool. Um, I, should, I should mention we do have a pretty diverse group of kids here. So it's not all advertising marketing too. Great. And the other question I have for everybody as you're uh, as you're kind of coming in is uh, I I'm assuming everybody is either recent grads or in final year. So chime in on that as well. Let me know kind of where you are in that. And, you know, and it's honestly anything you want to, to tell me about, um, you know, where you guys are, what, what you're kind of up to next. This is, um, this is a, a presentation that I tend to give fairly interactively. Um, and so there's a couple options here. I'm going to be asking some questions along the way. You're welcome just to chime in on the chat, and that works quite well. Um, but uh, if you want to speak up in person, that's totally cool too. So um, I'm, you know, whatever you're up for. So let me tell a little bit about kind of who I am and where, why I'm talking to you. So, uh, you know, first question is who is Sweat and Co? What is what is the company? Um, and I think to talk about that, you can you know, learn a little bit about me and kind of the road that took me here because I think. One thing that is true is that it would be very difficult to chart um, my career path. I'm not sure that like you would want to take that exact route, um, but there are some cool stops along the way. Um, so let me talk to them. So a few things to know. Um, one is that there are more people like me. These are my brothers. I am one of seven boys and one girl. We're all very tall. Um, this is us trying to squeeze into our high school uniform forms, uh, not entirely successfully. Um, I'm the guy here um, that didn't even get a number. So, you know, whatever. Uh, thanks for continuing to share the fun of the, your answers, folks. This is great to see. Um, and so uh, beyond, I was, you know, as far as teams go, beyond this particular team, um, Sweat & Co. actually has a really cool team of people, um, primarily PR professionals, content creators, um, who uh, do some amazing work for our clients. Um, I have a few kind of things that in my background that have been really helpful to that. One of them is that, um, is that I um, uh, used to be a tech reporter. So I used to write a, a lot back in the day, me back when uh, my hair was a lot blonder. Uh, and, um, and there's more of it, I suppose. Uh, and then um, I am also a novelist. So I have written two books so far. These have come out in the last, um, the last uh, four, three, four years. And it's a uh, post-apocalyptic series set in LA in a, in a world about 100 years in the future where everyone has died from a mysterious plague. That, sorry, everyone over 17 has died from a mysterious plague. 
So I promise I was not involved in the release of COVID. It just happened to work out that way that I ended up writing about it. So it was a little eerie. Um, but I uh, did check it out if you like sci-fi and dystopian and post-apocalyptic um, fiction. It's, it's pretty fun read. Um, and the other thing I did is I did a, a PR for agencies uh, in-house. And, and this is one of my favorite projects for Deutsche LA. Um, we, I don't know if you, if you guys have, uh, and chime in if you've ever had the opportunity to go to Cannes or any of these big conferences, um, I'd love to hear that. But one of the things you'd find out when you go is that you can get booze pretty much any time, day or night, um, anywhere you go in the city. But you can't get food, which is a real problem. And I found it the hard way, 5 a.m. on a Friday morning, you know, drunk and hungry with my friends and no solutions in sight. And I realized at that time that if we could figure out how to feed can, we would own that city. And um, so it took me a couple of years, but I came on this, of this idea of wrapping um, these motor scooters, this pizza fleet um, with our colors, and um, then delivering pizza to drunk people all throughout can. And we, we gave out 1,500 slices in the course of three days each of them these little boxes that have the Deutsch story, which is pretty cool because, you know, in Europe, Deutsch LA um, was considered, I, like people thought it was either the country or the bank. And so we did not have a lot of recognition. So this is really a cool thing for us. We got a ton of press. When I talk about doing PR, I'm not talking just things like press releases, that kind of thing. Um, I am also doing, I'm also, um, really focus on cool activities that will break through. So we'll talk about that. Um, and so uh, I don't know if you, if anyone here, I couldn't see if anyone's a communications major or anything like that. And, um, you know, there's a lot of similarities in between journal, people in journal, journalism and PR. But having been on the PR side, I think there's some kind of fundamental differences that that are important, um, at least from a perception point of view. So when when you're a journalist, this is pretty much how you view yourself. You know, you're like fighting the world, you're idealistic, you're just trying to do the right thing. Uh, and this is how you tend to view PR people. You know, same set of skills, perhaps not always using them for good. Um, and so, and I resisted for a long time becoming this person on the right, because I was nervous about what that would do, you know, to my career, what it would do to my kind of my aspirations to be creative and, and to be a great communicator. And when I and I did finally make the switch, and I will confess, there was a moment kind of like this. Um, and then I got over it. Um, because the reality is, is that um, it is a pretty amazing career. It is uh, a really cool way to combine your business knowledge with the ability to write and communicate, to speak to people. I would say it's a great career if you happen to be an extrovert or even if you play an extrovert really well. Um, so, you know, you get to work with people in kind of small doses. You get to tell stories. Um, and it's very cool. I would say that actually, after all these years, I'm more satisfied as a PR person, you know, kind of across a number of factors than, than I was before. So um, I know we've got a pretty wide range of people here, so you, things are going to vary here. But what I want to get into is what PR is and why that's relevant to you, even if you're not in this business. And so I'm going to talk a couple of things. And I'm going to be asking a couple of questions. So I want you guys to be kind of get your fingers exercised and just throw in ideas as we talk about this. So, oh, I should say these are the people that I work with. So I have the, I have the um, um, honor and distinction of working with almost exclusively with ad agencies. And that has been a really cool experience. You get to kind of tap into the creativity of ad agencies, but only for like a little bit of time. So you get to like create the creativity without the crazy. And it's a really cool niche. Um, there are very few of us in this industry who, who focus on PR for ad agencies, but it has been enjoyable. I'm not sure I would be into any other kind of PR, um, but there are people who love all this stuff too. It's just, this is just where I belong. Um, the one thing that's important is that we are PR people, 
Um, that's where we come from, and there's a, we have a number of really experienced PR people on our team, but ab above all, we view ourselves as consultants for the modern agency. Um, and we'll talk about that later, but for us, PR is driven heavily by, not just by what you say, but by who you are. Um, so we'll talk about that. Um, uh, and, and the key thing, and this, this comes from, from um, having pitched out thousands of stories uh, in, my, in my career and, have, and actually having received pitches for even more, literally thousands and thousands of, of uh, stories that people wanted me to write, which, of course, I couldn't write. And the one thing I learned is that it is impossible to spin a story into existence. You can't make someone write about it or care about it if it's not actually inherently interesting. So our focus as a, as a PR agency and as a consultancy, not just to tell your story, but to help you create a story worth telling. And that has a lot of facets. We're getting into that. And again, this is something that like, usually when people talk about PR, it's very surface level. You know, you call people, you send press releases, you do this, 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 and this. Um, what I'm gonna talk about is hope, what's something I hope is a much more in, intrinsic um, uh, way to think about PR. Uh, it, it basically is impossible to separate it from everything else you do. Um, so let me ask this. I feel like now I've like probably teased a little bit, but let me ask you, what do you think PR is? And it can be anything. You know, if it's like press releases, if it's, if you've got some experience in it, um, throw stuff in there as fast as you can, because I do want to kind of see some responses before I move on, uh, because it's important for me to get a sense of toolkits. Great. Yeah, definitely. We definitely have a bag of tricks that um, that we use um, pretty regularly and sometimes overused, uh, but it also goes pretty deeper than that. Any other thoughts on what PR is? I've seen a few people nod. I don't know if that means that you are kind of uh, into it, if you know what's kind of going on, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, one or two, two more things on what PR is or how you do it. Um, this is a very interesting, I guess, question. Um, I was talking to Sebastian about this, in fact, and um, from what I um, kind of know about PR, and that is kind of like um, it's kind of like a niche, and you have to, I guess, use it to your advantage as a PR specialist or manager, and also have mm -hmm. the company or the organization kind of use it as like. You can you can form it into whatever shape you want it to, um, in order to better convey your story and to update your audience on like the growth and the changes of your company yeah. and organization. That's what I see it as. No, that's great, Victoria. Thank you, and then thanks, um, uh, Alfea and and Veronica for chiming in. So definitely lots of communication. Like I said, this is sort of like the flip side of being a journalist. You write as much or more than they do. Uh, public image, branding, marketing. Um, you know, the publicists for like celebrities, um, crisis management, all of that's a form of PR. And I think, you know, Victoria, to your point, like it can kind of be whatever you want it to be. And there's sort of, frankly, versions of it that are much more fun. There are some that are much more legally challenging. You know, um, I wouldn't want to be you know, the PR person for like big tobacco or something like that. I feel like that would be a really tough gig. Um, way more fun to work with cool ad agencies and, and, and you know, and make cool ads. Um, so, you know, so it can be a lot of things. And so um, and, and I'm glad that we're getting kind of a spread of this because that's one of my points is, um, is that it is kind of much more multifaceted than people tend to think. It's because, again, they, when, people, when people do think of PR, they think, oh, let's send out a press release. Let's go try to get someone in the newspaper to write about this, which are very kind of archaic tools and um, and really doesn't represent PR as it is today. And, um, and so um, I don't know if any of you are part of this. It's a, a PRSSA, S, PRSSA, which is the PR Society for, I'm trying to remember what it is. It's the, this is a professional organization for PR. I'm not a member. I probably will never be because they, it irritates me. Um, but they actually created, they spent like a year, uh, a full year, to come up with with what a definition of SPR. And and actually they only came up they came up with three separate definitions. Um, and um, 
which to me is a huge problem. If you as a PR organization, one that's supposed to be able to tell a story, can't decide what your story is, that's you've already got an issue. So that tells me something about this industry um, that is maybe not the best part of it. I'm curious, drop in if you have any opinion, take a look at these. You tell me, you know, if any of these jump out, like if you prefer any definition over anything else. And if, you, if, there, if there is a clear favorite, tell me why, because I am curious. So, yeah, basically all using different words to say the same thing. I think some people wanted more adjectives, you know. Um, some people wanted to make sure they had things like strategic in there um, and process, uh, things like that. Um, and all sort of, yeah, all sort of saying the same thing in pretty boring ways and maybe kind of hiding what the actual definition is. For me, it's actually a super simple one. Um, and and you'll see it can kind of be used in a lot of different directions, uh, which is just that PR is getting people to say good things about you. Um, that's it. Like, we'll talk about methods, we'll talk about process, but your goal is to get your story out to people and have them say good things about, about you. And that can be kind of both PR uh, and other forms of, of media, which we'll talk about them in a moment. Um, there's a reason why this presentation is not just called PR, it's called PR, social media, and the art of talking to people that are humans at a distance. Um, so the principles of PR are really important um, and um, can be used in all sorts of ways. So, um, and it's really crucial to, to start to expand what we mean by PR, to start using it differently, because telling a story has never been more important. There's way more noise. Um, competition from other companies, um, fewer outlets to, to get to write about it in the traditional sense. Um, so, it's, and it's much, so it's much more challenging. Um, it's a lot harder to make noise. Um, you know, uh, we've seen across the board, the publications that we used to work with have dramatically decreased their uh, reporter headcount because of budget issues. Um, they're hiring uh, less and less experienced pe people and more and more uh, inexperienced people. And all that kind of adds up to, and there's a lot of like crossover. I mean, it's crazy, like, you know, like merry-go-round um, job changes right now in the advertising press, for example. Uh, and so when that happens, there's just fewer places to pitch stories and, you know, fewer reliable homes for this stuff. And so, um, so it's just harder to make noise. And so again, being creative with how you do things is gonna make a big difference. Um, and the other thing that's happening is that shifts in the world of media. So I, I'm assuming if you guys are in, you're, if you're in business or marketing, that you're comfortable with, this, with the idea of the three different kinds of media. Um, paid media being the ads that you typically buy on TV, that kind of thing. Um, earned media being PR, and then owned media being your website, your social channels, the areas that you can control, right? Um, in marketing organizations, those things have typically have been very separate. Um, the, the advertising people over here in paid media rarely talk to people in earned media, and then they kind of fight over who's supposed to be doing social. Or honestly, depending on the company, they fight about who has to do social media because that can be a pain in the ass for a company. Um, so, like this, so they tend to stay separate for a reason. That's happened for a long time. But what we're seeing from just like a from a market shift really is that all of this is starting to blur together. Um, the things, especially I would say, with earned and owned media, they are becoming much more distinguishable. Um, you know, from from each other, uh, and so um, and paid media is starting to come into play there too. You're seeing a lot more content that would, in some ways, be considered sort of like just you know its own media, but it's also advertising. It's you know it's good storytelling, um, but it's advertising too, um, and so that's happening a lot. Um, and so I'm going to ask this question. I feel like a lot of people don't know what PR is, but everybody knows what social media is, or at this point in your life. And, and I suspect that most of you 
have pretty much grown up with social media always being part of your world, like at least since the time you're allowed to have your own phone. So I'm going to ask, so my question is, um, again, this is one drop, drop in or speak up, but how do social media and PR relate? Um, because they do relate, but I'm, so I'm curious to see if you guys see the connection or want to venture a guess with that. And this is why I drink some water. You can take a look. Would you say it's how you rep? Uh, would you say it's how you represent your brand, whether it's on a different platform or in real life? Right, right. So if you're, are you saying basically like you would probably rep your, represent your brand in a very similar way? It's just a different platform. Yeah, it's to try to keep it consistent. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Exactly, I would say it's true. Brand development. Yeah, social media is a tool. Social media is used in PR. Yeah. All those things are true. Um, like I said, they're kind of blurring together. Uh, but I'll give you kind of a little cheat sheet, and this is really useful because you know social media. So it now means you know PR. You just didn't know that you knew it yet. So we're going to talk about this. Like, uh, so let me, I'll show you this little next slide, and this is a good thing to remember. Um, really, when it comes down to it, social media is PR without the middleman. Um, you know. It's almost, it's almost the exact same process of deciding what to say um, on, on your channel. Um, it's just a question of like, who is that, who is that message for? You know, if it's for uh, people on Instagram, you're gonna communicate that a different way. If it's on LinkedIn, you're gonna commun communicate that a different way. If it's on a blog, a medium, if it's, um, you know, if it's, if it's something you're pitching to the New York Times, the message may still be the same. What you want to say, and it is gonna, it's gonna be the same. How you say it is gonna be different and who you say it to. So keep that in mind, that whenever you think, you know, I'm not really sure about PR, start going back to what you know about social media and you'll find it to be a pretty helpful frame of reference. Um, and I don't know if you guys, like, uh, I've, been, I've been thinking a little bit about this, um, this world. Um, and so speaking of that, like if you look around, let's just say in the last six months, what are some of the coolest social media and PR activations you've seen done? You know, and this could be from a brand, it could be from individuals, you know, maybe celebrities who've done something really cool. Like what, what are some of the things that you really love to see um, you know, coming through? Um, I'll probably say because living in Dubai, they do a lot of advertisement on the Burj Khalifa, a lot of brands and launches. Uh huh. On um, advertising on what? I missed that very key part. Oh, and actually, on the Burj, on the um, on the Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest building. Oh yeah, yeah. So it makes sense. So it's a huge, uh, huge canvas for people to work on. That makes total sense. All right, Keanu Reeves. At, at E3 for Cyberpunk 2077. Sebastian, I'm not sure I actually have seen that yet. Tell me what that, tell me what that uh, is. Yeah, so a, if you have heard of the Witcher series, the company that had worked, the studio that worked on that has been working mm -hmm. on a new Cyberpunk as it is open world game. And they decided to bring out Keanu Reeves because he was cast in the, as a character in the game originally for mm -hmm. a su surprise announcement. And I think I, I just remember like it was supposed to be Nintendo, like a Nintendo's year, but like when, right when they did that, that's everyone what everyone was talking about for the entire rest of the weekend. All to be just like there was. You know, a big... now you mentioned it. My son was talking about it. He is definitely <laughs> um, in. He is a big Witcher. Uh, fan and um, and and actually specifically mentioned Keanu Reeves. I just never made the connection. That's funny. <laughs> uh, and then so yeah, so every time Nintendo releases and Nintendo Direct, it keys info. So uh, yeah, so I mean, what's interesting about this is like I said, a lot of the stuff um, could really have been done, like it may be a social media activation, but it also took place on PR. Um, and so. I think just in general, one thing I want to kind of just lay out is think about the mark, the advertising campaigns that you've liked this year. You know, um, one for me, for example, is the uh, the Nike 
the ads that they put out where they did cross cuts between sports and they kind of edited everything perfectly. So you're playing tennis and all of a sudden you're swinging a tennis, also you're swinging a baseball bat. Um, and they did it during the pandemic when you couldn't shoot anything. So this is all footage that they happened to have. And they went through like something like 4,000 hours of footage, something insane to get this. And, and it was an advertising um, program, but it also got a ton of PR, which they aggressively put out. Um, and it got amazing social pickup. In fact, that's how I always know when um, a, a campaign is a success, is if I see it on my social feed before I see it in a, like a, in a publication, because that to me shows that something's got some heat. And uh, so that's kind of where, you know, we, we, that's kind of where we go. So I don't know, uh, so maybe the next slide, I don't know if you, any of you guys were sad about the Kardashians closing closing up shop on their show. Probably not, but I feel like this is another thing where you guys have probably spent your entire life knowing about the Kardashians in some way. But I didn't. I mean, it, they started much further in my career. And the one thing that I've kind of come to realize is they were an amazing case study for PR because, at least at the beginning, there's no actual product for themselves. Like, they didn't have kind of any careers or particular talents for anything at, at, at the beginning. It was just simply like Kim and her family sort of constantly promoting themselves in this cycle and to the point where they turned themselves into a product that became newsworthy, that became that fed, you know, TV content that fed social media. And they're still going, um, you know, and and so for me, I always love that, that as, a, as a case study because it's not like, there's, there's not really a product there that, that you have that, that you get distracted by. Like this is pure image and pure kind of, you know, essentially like manipulation. And, but it, it just reminds me that like we're in a world where um, everything that brands do is designed to be talked about. Um, it, everything we do is meant to be shared and passed along. So we kind of have to be thinking about that as we go. Um, so, uh, so just anyway, just kind of think about that and then we'll go into some, some of these rules. So these are my eight rules for PR. These are my eight rules this week. They may change to nine or seven or, or four, depending on my mood, but, um, handy for you to have. And I would say, especially eight rules for PR, the way that I think about it, which I will admit is not super traditional. So, um, all right. First rule. Everything is PR. Um, so, you know, the answer in terms of what is PR, that was kind of a trick question because literally almost everything you as, do as a brand has PR potential and you have to start viewing it that way. So I'm going to ask this question. This is a very important one for people to answer. But tell me in chat or on, on, um, on video, what kinds of things do you share on your own social uh, channels, whatever those may be? What kinds of things do you like to pass along? News, life updates, great, career things, definitely. Um, I'm gonna ask Sebastian because your mic's on. What, what about you, Sebastian, what do you share? Everything from advocacy and materials and resources to uh, help people get to wherever they need to go. And yeah. Uh, the, um, it's, uh, you guys, I can tell you guys are a very focused group because everyone's sharing a lot of like our professional development stuff and I, I appreciate that. But I also think that we all tend to also share things like um, food picks, you know, uh, advocacy tips, posts from organizations I'm involved in, hobbies, news, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm going to have you think about that and I'm going to show you some other things that I think were, were interesting. Um, so what the reason why I asked that is because, because we share the things that say, tell something about us, about what we believe in and what, what kind of our values are, you know? So if it's, if we like funny stuff, we share funny things. If we want to be, we want to be sort of like viewed as the people who know, um, you know, what the latest and greatest trends are, we're going to be out on top of that. If we want to make sure that people see us for having a great sense of style, we're going to be taking 
meticulously crafted pictures, you know, so all those things. Like this, so these, so every decision we make and we share relates to what we care about and to a better our credibility. Um, and that's important because it's the same factor that that um, journalists um, go through too. Everything they write about says something about who they are as a professional. Um, and so we have to kind of always think about that as we're writing about it. So I'm going to show you two examples of a clothing company and kind of what they decided to share. So uh, this is on Gap uh, a couple of years ago. I don't even know why I was on Gap. I try not to make a habit of it, but there I was. And um, and and all and actually, I wish I, I had done the screenshots that showed it. But at the bottom of this page, there were like a million like share icons. You could share to Instagram. You could share to Facebook. You, you know, kind of whatever it was at that at that moment. And I remember looking at this, and this is the reason why I took the 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 um, this, by the way, this is their spring cover. It was uh, Tangerine Dream, I believe. Um, and, uh, and I remember looking at this and, and thinking, who on earth would you share that with? Like, you know, like your mom, like, like uh, hey, I guess I found something you can get me for my birthday if you don't have anything else kind of thing. You know, I did need a pair of shorts. Uh, but it wasn't anything that like reflects anything about this, and I'm going to guarantee almost no one clicked on that share button. Um, by contrast, I want to show you this this um, image. I don't know if you guys are familiar with a, with a clothing company called Beta Brands, but they're they're basically built around the idea that everything they they do it needs to be P, have PR value. So they do really weird clothes. Like um, one of them is quarter rounds, which are basically side, sideways quarter, corduroy pants. Um, and those are cool and fun at home. But then they do the thing they put in on every page, they put in fake science. So here we're, we're learning that quarter rounds drastically lower your crotch heat index. Um, I don't know that they do, but it's, you know, if that's a concern for you, that's, that's what you're going to buy. But certainly you're going to pass it along because it's funny. Uh, the other thing they did was they created a blanket that they called the, um, the badge soft blanket because it was the second softest substance in the universe next only to the womb of a marshmallow mermaid. So um, I don't know how many people bought this blanket, but I saw lots of pictures, pictures posted on Facebook. And what happened is that journalists wrote about them a lot um, in, in fashion. Um, you know, they're constantly trying to fill stuff. And so they basically designed this so that journalists would pick it up. And then fans were also sharing it. Um, they were, in fact, they're still on their site. If you look at it, they don't use professional models. They only use um, photos of people uh, in their their items that they posted on social media. Um, and so they get like free, lots of free exposure, um, not just because they, ne they never have to pay for a model, but like that's now on someone's Instagram feed. Um, and so, so they had a really cool principle, which I'm gonna share because I think this is important. Um, is that you have to build PR into your product. Whatever that product is um, and whatever the audience is, it's going to be different, of course, based on who your audience is, but you have to build shareability and PR value into everything you do. And so they had an expression, which I wrote down um, when I met with them, uh, which is to make things forwardable, make, make, create things that people want to pass along and that they want to share. And if you can do that, you can crack the code on both social media and in PR. Um, again, it's the same stuff. So when I'm talking to people about something they've created, and, and this is typically in advertising, um, everybody gets super excited about the stuff they do. You know, we want people to know about it. We think people should know about it. But I asked them this question because going back to my early point about credibility, this is a really high bar. And it basically it's this. Um, would you share this if you weren't getting paid to do it? So if you hadn't worked on something, um, would you pass this along? Especially if it came from a brand. And I can tell you from my personal experience, that's almost nothing. Like I will maybe post, repost something from a brand once every three months. Um, and if it is, it's gonna be really damn good. So like, that's the thing that we're going to, we've got to ask when you're making product. And again, this is not necessarily the PR person. This could be you creating a new service for your, 
for the tech company that you work for, whatever it might be, the next Uber, like all those things kind of have to have, have to have tech PR built into it. So you may not ever do PR for a living, but this stuff matters to you because, um, because it, you build it into what you do. So um, you guys definitely comment on this if you have things like that, this is kind of making you think about um, I am going to start going into some little more practical things that are specifically, some, some are related to PR people, but all are related business. Um, and I'm going to try to speed up a little bit. So first of all, bake in the PR. Um, so I was like, got to like get people hungry. This is the best thing with my brunch. But um, uh, for our ad agencies, we, we try to make PR get in the process really early. So we actually meet with them before they ever show stuff to their clients. Um, we get in really far in advance with the idea that we're going to try to shape the story into the best PR value possible. Um, next thing is get your story straight. Um, and this is shockingly hard for any company. I would say it's very hard for agencies. And there's one reason. Sometimes you just can't see it from, from, from the inside. You know, it isn't you just like I, I have had probably. I don't know how many conversations I've had with ad agencies at this point. And theoretically, ad agencies are really good at this, right? Because they do this for the clients. Um, but what I hear over and over again is, you know, we're just really bad at telling our own story. And at a certain point, that becomes not like an individual problem. It becomes a universal problem. Um, and and it's, it's really mostly because you can't see it from the inside. So you need someone with an outside perspective to come in and help sometimes. You also have to be really rigorous about trying to figure that out. One thing I always ask for is essentially, what's your cocktail napkin statement about who it is, what you're doing? What is it you are doing that no one else does or does well? Um, what is it that's going to change um, what people are, um, you know, what, what, what is it going to change about the way people act in their lives? These are all things you have control over. Um, and what I always like to say is um, when, you're, when you're doing this, try to write down in one sentence, only one sentence, maybe two if like you're just really stuck and then later you make it one. But basically, um, just like I said, write down something that describes you and only you because um, you can say lots of things that do describe you. You know, I like dogs. Well, everybody likes dogs, maybe. I don't know. Um, I also like cats. So maybe those two things are unique. Uh, but but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's basically the key part is getting the part that, like, if someone read that, they'd be like, oh, that's Victoria. That's clearly what she's all about, you know. Um, and so, so try to get that. This takes a lot of work. Like, it takes, like, I've been working with someone on, like, for two weeks on what their napkin statement is. Um, but you can get there, um, and that's one of the things you can do for free. You don't need to have a PR agency. Um, yeah, and it's a great way to brand yourself. Thanks for asking that, Jonathan. Yeah, I would say as you are going out, if you're going into the workforce or trying to figure this out, this is an incredibly valuable exercise for you just to be like, okay, I do all sorts of great stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks, Susan. Like, like that's the kind of thing I look for is like you you start to look at that, and you're going to start big, right? Um, and I like this what Sebastian put down because that is something that like, you know, I has, has a lot of other skills that I met him. I know he's got all these great things, but one thing that's really is for unique is about this needing to bring, helping to bring together communities. And Victoria, your question is, yes, it could be a combination of traits and hobbies at this point. I would also say it's like kind of like, what are you really good at, you know? And for a long time as a journalist and communications person, the thing I wrote was, um, I write fast and I write well, you know, and that was the thing that was super crucial in like a business environment, especially not so hard in a journalism environment, but like a lot of really crappy writers in business. So like, so that was kind of like my, my thing that distinguished me and that got me in the door. Um, and and I, I mean, I also kind of was kind of an asshole in my, PR, I was very cocky in my, my resume. So like some people thought that was a little too much, but it's very useful. So anyway, do that for yourselves. I think it's very, like, it's a very cool exercise. Um, and, and so, like, that's really kind of part of, like, clarifying that. One way that we find it, I'm not going to go great details, 
is when we go into a client, we do something we call agency vital assessment, which is about a month-long audit where we look at everything about them. We talk to the, the, to the um, leadership, the employees, we talk to clients, we talk to journalists. We do um, a, um, would you say it ever changes? How do you describe yourself? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, this funny, it's a really good question about me right now. Um, I'd probably, that's a longer question. So I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pass, but it will change over time, especially as you develop more experience and, and you start to understand what you like. But for us, we go in, we, we go do a deep analysis and then we actually um, break them down and talk about their strengths in four different areas, uh, communications, creativity, clients, their culture. And we benchmark it relative to the industry and give them a score. Um, and it's kind of, a, it's really, kind of a crazy experience, but what clients have told us is it's valuable not just for PR, but for business. So um, one of one of our clients, the CEO of, a, of an agency named Observatory, said that this is something that, um, you know, they still look at it, um, and they use it not just for PR, but for their entire business. So, you know, kind of anytime you can get someone to help you get to the heart of who you are, that's going to be helpful. But especially as a student, you're probably not going to have that as much. Although maybe you would, it'd be a good, good exercise to do with your classmates and you know, professors, instructors, and stuff like that as well. But I think it's worth it's worth digging into. Um, so once you figure out what your story is, then you got to make the story better. Um, we we have a sentence all the time in PR where someone gives us something and they're like, uh, they kind of just throw it at us and then they go and they say, go PR the shit out of this thing. And you're like, well. What am I supposed to do with this thing? It's not a good story. So the question is, is if you don't have a great story, you're going to make it better. Because otherwise, nothing else is going to matter. So this, this, is my, this is my little tension break. You can do all the planning in the world. You can make something awesome. But if you don't build PR angles into it, if you don't have, um, don't have that story finally now, everything else just kind of goes to shit. Um, and so when we look at PR, for agencies in particular, this is how we view it. PR is at the top, but you see from the outside. But all these other factors, including culture and creativity, drive that. And in fact, culture and creativity are the single biggest drivers of PR. Not just not our writing press releases. Culture and creativity are the things that like make great news possible. So we start with our agencies um, by making them better agencies, um, and that's one of our fundamental beliefs. We we want to help you build a better agency. So the other thing we do is we do this presentation, which Sebastian uh, and a few others maybe got to experience, but it's called How to Be Famous in Six Easy Steps. And it's just basically kind of an extension of this, of building PR into what you do. Um, and it tends to create better work and, and a better creative culture. Um, this one I'm gonna share, because it's kind of cool. Do you guys remember this? This is a long time ago. So no one had seen this. This is for Volkswagen um, as a teaser for a Super Bowl spot that involved Star Wars. You guys probably remember the little mini Darth Vader spot. This was actually a sequel to it. It was a teaser, but they felt a ton of pressure to make sure that people were seeing it. And one thing they did, which is interesting, is they designed this entire video to basically be watched and rewatched. They kind of put like things in there, the right amount of details, like the Chewbacca, Bandelier, and, and things like that. So you could start figuring out which character was which, um, but not enough that it was like super obvious. You know, some of them were. So they, like they meant it to be like shared and people to talk about it and rewound and actually did incredibly well. Uh, but yeah, so this is something that happened before you guys were certainly in business. It was happening at a young age. I wouldn't expect you to know it, but I think it's fun. And honestly, since 
We've already talked about Star Wars. I guess we just kind of continue the theme. Um, I'm going to skip this part because we don't have time to go for it. But um, the other thing is, is you've got a lot of choices up there in terms of media channels. And you have to really start to kind of place your bets um, and um, uh, understand what each channel does for you. You know, what like a news outlet would do for you versus, um, versus Instagram versus, you know, TikTok or things like that. Like, what does that do for your brand or for your, for your client's brand? Um, and uh, you also, and so, but this is one thing, again, I talked about before, like you, you, who you are and the stories you tell can be translated to all sorts of things across earned, owned, paid media. It's just, it just, it starts with this one point and then you have to start to break out the pieces that are gonna matter to that particular audience. Um, and, I always believe you also kind of have to match the medium to your message or vice versa. This was a game. I don't know if you guys know Twisted Metal. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not my game. I didn't really play it, but I did work on this campaign. And it's a really pretty violent game. And the, and the promotion was that people got to use a remote control device and real guns to shoot up this ice cream truck in the desert, the clown's ice cream truck. Totally crazy, totally violent. And so as instead of writing a press release, um, I actually had this poster printed on um, gun target um, paper, and one of our willing volunteers who loves guns went out and shot it with a real bullet. And then we sent it to journalists to invite them to watch it. And we got coverage, in this case, for the, for the press release itself, um, because it was so unusual. So everything, you know, everything shifts depending on where you're selling something. So and this last one, I think you guys kind of figure this one out, but if you can't get in the news, make your own. Um, the biggest finding from the pandemic is that content can be made by anyone. Um, so I think I originally kind of got into uh, meet with Sebastian with, through another organization who had watched agencies under quarantine. Some of you may have watched this, but this was basically a, a two week webinar series we did daily, which was insane. Um, and we, um, and it was basically to help agencies get through quarantine and leave it better when they, when they came in. And we had a um, really strong response to this. We actually, over time, had about a thousand subscribers to this. And I can tell you that we were certain of our episodes did better than the ones being put on by like the ad weeks or the ad ages. And so, you know, the biggest thing that's happened since the pandemic is that like, all those rules about who got to make content and not a ball in a way. So if you can't find a home for it in PR, consider making it, make something. I mean, the, the, the platforms are easy to use. There's very little cost to it if you're doing it yourself. So just think about that. But one thing is, is anything you share on social, anything that you, um, you know, share in PR, um, you got to, um, you have to make people care about it. So this is something I, I, found this in the very, very early days of social media. People are like, we're just going to put it on Twitter and people are going to talk about it. It's going to go viral, you know? And, and we would say things like, people want to join the conversation. And this is like kind of like a marketer's dream, right? Yeah, fuck yeah. Let me, let me in. It doesn't work that way. You have to work at it. You have to make people care. And if you don't have the message that people will respond to, it's just never going to happen. Um, so getting close to the end, and I, I'm going to, I mean, these are really quick. Big one for me is I think there's always this perception in PR that you should spin stories. I do not believe in that. Like, I won't tell a story that I can't believe in. Uh, I mean, maybe it's just emphasized back, but I will never sort of tell a false story with the idea that, that people are going to buy this. Because as I said before, you can't spin a story into existence anyway. It's useless. All you do is damage your credibility. Um, I showed this picture of this guy smoking because um, the thing is, Barrett, it was a... Uh, um, a uh, study that I want to say, one, well, one of the tobacco companies did, it was in the Czech Republic, which had a fairly hefty smoking problem, but also a big market for them. And they did this health study, which showed that smoking actually reduced impact on the country's healthcare system. That was the headline, right? But then if you like read the actual study, the reason why it reduced the impact of the healthcare system is that people died they never actually made it to the hospital or didn't stay there very long because they were dead from smoking. 
So it was like this sort of like almost the worst possible, most just atrocious spin you can imagine. Um, so don't do it. That's all, that's kind of all I'll say there. The other thing I'm going to say is really crucial is build the phone relationship. Think of like who you, in this, in this age, who do you call on the phone? It's not, you know, it's not like your classmate typically. It's not anyone um, except for maybe like your mom and your best friend and stuff like that. But when you're a journalist, when you're working journalist, you have to have that kind of relationship. You have to be able to pick up the phone and talk to someone. Um, because if you don't, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to respond to you. And I will say, like, in our world of advertising, you know, me, my team and I have some of the best relationships in the business. And we're like karaoke buddies. We hang out after hours. Um, you know, we have crazy stories to tell about each other. doesn't mean they're going to write about everything that I do, but because of that, they will give us that extra couple of minutes it takes to, um, you know, to, to, to read a story and um, decide if I can publish it. And sometimes it's all the difference it makes. Um, and the last thing I'm just going to say, I'll go into detail, measure, like you try to gather everything you can. Problem is it's very tricky since I made this, stat, which is 63% of PR stats are made up, um, with including this one. Like, it's very difficult to, to measure PR. You have to, like, look at a lot of different things at, and, and you know, don't kind of over-rely on things like impressions. You know, you're going to have to use your own kind of ability to analyze things to make sure you're doing it. So, I'm going to do with that. So, what you measure? So, this is my kind of thing. You guys are now trying to go out into the industry. So get out and do it. There is a lot that's possible, but I want you to kind of come in with, with you know, really strong, you know, self, sense of who yourself is and how you can use these channels to your advantage. Um, I know we're two minutes away from this. If anyone wants to ping in for a question or two, I'm happy to do that. I can stick around for like a, just a couple of minutes longer, um, but it's up to you. Any questions? All right. So I think everyone knows where to find me on LinkedIn. It's really not hard. There's like one Jeff Sweat in LinkedIn, probably. Um, and I'm the one with glasses. So if you have questions, let me know. Um, oh, thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Um, oh, it's still the new PR. Oh, I can tell you. Two skills new for PR. Um, well, actually, three. One is you need to be able to write and communicate well. But I always say the other thing is um, you need to be fearless and warm. Like you've got to be able to talk to anyone if you need to, but you've also got to be kind. Like, and that's a very different thing about um, PR people tend to have this bad reputation as being like kind of battle axis. And that's, to me, that's like the worst kind of PR person in the world. I don't think they're super effective. Um, I think you get so much more done by building relationships with people, bringing in the things they need. And so you may not necessarily have all of the kind of PR skills at the beginning, the stuff you certainly will learn along the way. But if you start with those three things, the ability to communicate, um, and then being fearless, being warm uh, and kind, um, it'll take you a long, a long ways. And I would say it will take you a long ways in business as well. Um, just thanks, everyone. I really appreciate your time. Um, and like I said, hit me up if you have questions. Um, I may not be able to answer all of them, but I will, you know, do my best. Um, and uh, have a great Saturday, everyone. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate your time and keep in touch. Oh, of course.